that. I'm Adelina Comas Herrera and the curator of LTC COVID. And um, I'd just like to thank, uh, first of all, Clara Lorenz Dant for organizing and sharing today's webinar, taking a look at the situation of Germany and, and essentially also let you know about the future LTC COVID webinar. So welcome everyone and uh, Clara, thank you very much and uh, all yours. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you and welcome everyone to uh, today's webinar. And I'm delighted that we can talk about COVID-19 and the long-term care sector in Germany, and especially that we've got such fantastic speakers who've agreed to talk. Unfortunately, one of our speakers, uh, Kerstin Himmel, is unable to be here today, but I hope that we can follow up on, on that soon. Um, but here is just very briefly uh, the plan for today. So I'll give a very brief introduction to the long-term care uh, situation of, of COVID, the long-term uh, COVID-19 experience in Germany, and then Thomas Fischer will take over and he'll be talking about where to from here, uh, how the COVID-19 pandemic amplified some of the structural challenges of Germany's home care sector. Then we'll hear from Heinz Wurzgang, who will be talking about differences in outcome, the role of structural factors in COVID-19 mortality in care homes in Germany, and then we'll hear from Francisca Laporte Uribe, who will be talking about dementia and COVID-19 in New Zealand, Chile and Germany, and the learning for resilience. And then before we go on for some discussion Q&A, um, I'll have uh, one more slide to show you sort of just summing up the situation uh, in Germany a bit. Um, right, um, before I start the presentation, the idea is that we will be running through the presentation consecutively. Um, and if you have any questions, please put them in the chat um, and then we can follow up on them later. And obviously later on, we really uh, encourage you to also, you know, contribute and, and add your questions and comments um, uh, when we get to the discussion part. So without uh, holding us further back, I'll uh, just start with a brief overview. So for those of you who are not familiar with the German uh, system, in Germany, there are currently about uh, 4.13 million people who have long-term care needs. And these are people who have been assessed at uh, care le uh, levels one to five. So one being less severe and five being the most severe uh, care needs. Um, most of the people, almost 80% of people in Germany are cared for in the community. Um, most of those um, living at home receive care from only relatives and friends who are but but who are in receipt of the care allowance and of those most people have a care level of about two of two and three um, there are about 30 percent of people living at home uh, who receive domiciliary care uh, care and um, there are about well 14,688 domiciliary care provider most of them are private for profit providers and uh, private not-for-profit providers um, in the residential care setting is uh, a lot fewer people. We've only got about 20% of people with long-term care needs uh, living in residential care settings and their care needs are a little bit higher. Uh, most of them usually uh, around level three to five. Um, there are about uh, 15,400 residential care homes. Um, most of them private, uh, not-for-profit providers and private for-profit providers. The role of public providers, both in care in the community and residential care is, is very small. Um, there are 422,000 uh, domiciliary care workers where over 70% are involved in providing direct care. Um, and there are 796,000 residential care staff where again, 74.5% are involved in direct care. And in both those groups, actually the age is, is relatively high, 13% in a residential care, 12% are aged 60 and over, um, and over 40% aged 50 and over in both of those, which obviously uh, will be interesting when we are looking at COVID. So this is just to give you a bit of a background of the size and the numbers that we have in Germany. Then in terms of the, the system, so Germany has an uh, long-term care insurance which has been established in 1995 and the main goal of this insurance is enabling people to live a self-determined life. Um, the long-term care insurance covers people of all ages, so not just older people, um, and people have a choice between care allowance in uh, kind home care and residential care. 
the system is financed through equal contribu contributions between employers and employees, and childless people pay, pay a slightly higher contribution rate um, than people who have children. Um, the long-term care insurance is not designed to cover all of the long-term care related costs. So people living in residential care settings um, can pay up to 2,400 euros per month, but that's its cap. Um, and this includes food and rent. Um, there, um, where people can't afford uh, adding, providing uh, their, their private contribution, social security mechanisms step in. Um, private contribution towards residential care costs is varies a bit between, uh, the, uh, between the lender so in, in Baden-Württemberg, it's uh, more than a thousand euros on average and Thuringia is less than 450. That's reflecting a very complex situation, historically um, from different wage rates and living costs between the states in uh, former West and East Germany. Um, but there has been a care reform very recently and that is set out uh, to reduce the contributions uh, of uh, uh, private contributions of people living in residential care. Um, right. Uh, care in Germany is organized through a legal framework, which is uh, set out in the legal uh, social codebook. Um, the German government has set, uh, has dedicated a person who's responsible for care um, that got announced in 2014, I think, and was uh, established in, in 2018. Uh, the lender, so Germany is divided into 16 lender and the local authorities within those are responsible for the care infrastructures. Uh, providers are responsibility for the uh, quality and uh, uh, it's usually a close cooperation with long-term care funds and municipalities. Uh, there's also a system of independent quality controls. Um, the Long-Term Care Insurance Act prioritizes informal or unpaid care um, and there's usually a, a mix, a reliance on a mix of both uh, formal and unpaid and informal care. Um, Great, so let's move on briefly. I just really want to uh, give a brief overview uh, to COVID and the mortality in Germany. Um, there are, this is data from the 1st of July that was published by the Robert Koch Institute. Um, 3.7 million confirmed cases across the German population and almost 91,000 deaths. Um, in uh, residential care settings, there are 137,000 cases, um, and 77% of these cases are among people aged 60 and older, um, and 17% uh, roughly resulted in deaths. Among people working in residential care settings, uh, there have been uh, approximately 68,000 cases, and 11% of those cases are among people uh, 60 and uh, older and this has resulted in 179 deaths. Now, what I should add is, what I've put here with a, a little asterisk is that this data is not just reflecting people living in long-term care settings, um, but the data is grouped so that it's also reflecting people living in asylums, asylums for homeless people, group accommodation for asylum seekers, prisons and other group accommodation. So if we would only focus in on, on people living in residential care, that now proportions would probably be slightly higher. There is now also early data coming out on uh, excess mortality, the care report 2020, uh, looking at data from the AOK Sickness Fund, um, covered data between January and, and June 2020 and compared that with the five previous years. And they did find that there was a 20% higher proportion of deaths among people living in residential care settings or nursing homes. Um, who are 60 years and older, and that was high, the highest for people aged 80 to 84, and people with more severe care needs, um, and also people with dementia were found to have a 25% uh, higher mortality in comparison to average years, but um, this is only looking at the very first wave, so uh, looking at, like I said, January to June, um, and I added the reference in, in the list, so if you want to look at more detail, you can find that there. And I think also Heinz will, looking, will be talking more about uh, mortality in care homes, so he's probably best placed to tell us a bit more about this. But um, that's it for me for now. So I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll then hand over 
Thomas, I think. Thomas, if you want to share your screen. Um, yeah, good day. Um, thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak here. And I'll uh, look at COVID and what we can learn from it um, through the lens of the home care uh, sector, really. Um, I'm a professor of nursing at uh, EHS University in Dresden, which you can see in the background. And um, also, I'm the coordinator of the long term care guideline for uh, home care during the pandemic. So um, I'm talking here, I'm, I'm basing, uh, I'll use some of the discussions we've had in uh, during the um, uh, work on that guideline, as well as from the um, uh, Public Health COVID-19 Network, where I chair uh, the part of the group on nursing. And I will also share some insights from a discussion we've had last week with representatives from um, users, uh, home care users, and uh, home care uh, uh, services. So um, we've heard all about this already, so I won't go through this in detail. I will just like to point you towards um, the health insurance basket that also pays for some parts of home care in Germany. So that's the middle uh, basket in this picture here. And that covers treatment related um, expenses. Uh, also um, ADL assistance can be covered by the health insurance if there's a doctor's prescription and if it helps to avoid hospital admission. Um, the long-term care insurance covers up to 1,995 euros per month for, for in-kind, uh, as an in-kind um, benefit, as in-kind benefits for people who live at home, and that's level five, as indicated before, and um, I don't think I have to add more here, um, and we've saw that. So the system really is um, the home care system is probably, and I would like to add for that as a, as a thought, a relatively fragmented system. Uh, so we have the home care services and additional services have been added uh, during past years, um, but they're not necessarily integrated with nursing and social services um, and kind of coexist. And that's kind of, that's important for the COVID situation. Um, when it comes to integration, um, this could be classed as or classified as a voluntary integration, and that's both on a lateral level. So um, home care service providers do not necessarily co uh, cooperate, even if they work in the same area, they do, they do not cooperate with daycare services and other social care services, they may act very independently. And on a vertical level, um, they're not integrated with GP services and other healthcare services. And that also is important for the COVID situation. So integration is uh, not something that the system is known, uh, is, is well known for really. We have, and that might be strange for, or might be, might come as a surprise for many international listeners really, no involvement of the municipalities in planning and oversight of home care uh, or of social care and long-term care uh, at all, uh, which is really a problem because municipalities cannot influence what's happening. It's a market-driven market -driven system. Uh, and the municipalities are based merely bystanders in what's going on in their area. Um, we've seen the numbers for, uh, for residential care, and we only have very, very well problematic figures for how many people who received home care were affected by SARS-CoV-2 so far. Uh, the official record lists 1,130 uh, users and 2,697 staff. This is very, very likely um, a, a, an, an underestimation. And part of that is because um, the category home care required was only added to the statistics in uh, autumn last year. And it's voluntary for the local health authorities to make, uh, to make any information available uh, as to where an infection occurred. So our databases, around the effects of COVID for carers, users, families is very, very, very limited. During the first wave, there have been uh, a number of reports on how COVID and infection control measures inf uh, affected users and their families. And this is just a recent report came out last week. And um, what's quite clear is that um, 
the use of professional home care services, nursing services was dramatically reduced. And that was both because the users did not wish to continue because they were mainly afraid of the infection risk they saw in uh, healthcare workers coming into their homes and services being discontinued by the service providers. Um, dramatically reduced availability of use of daycare services. So they, those were mainly shut. Uh, we did have in place provisions for childcare for those who needed it. We did not have provisions in place for people who needed home care or daycare and other, sort of, uh, other sorts of support for their care arrangements. Um, other support services were reduced as well. And in this survey, care as well as if they had perceived any changes in the people they cared for in the homes. Uh, and they reported that they saw a loss of physical and emotional functioning in users. Um, so this is very subjective, but they, for example, saw that their mobility was reduced and fear and other um, psychosocial symptoms was increased. Also carers themselves perceived increased levels of stress and demand on their roles. And that's not a surprise really um, with all other support services being in short supply really. So coming from here and looking at that, I would think that there may be four, maybe more, but certainly four main challenges that were posed um, to the home care system during due to the pandemic or are still posed to that. So for families and users, there's certainly an increased need for education. However, education is not part of the package that the long-term care insurance provides, neither is it part of the package that the health, care, uh, that the health insurance provides. Um, if it is being provided, and in our guidelines, we surely recommend that if it's being provided, it's basically uh, nurses and healthcare workers providing this as an extra service that is not being reimbursed. The same is true for, uh, for psychosocial support that people were very much in need of, especially carers who felt overwhelmed with the responsibility um, at times. Uh, and again, this is not something that either of the insurance systems covers. Um, prevention and health promotion, apart from um, infection control, which clearly is very important and is not part of the package. Again, there's also an increased need for prevention and health promotion in terms of physical and uh, emotional functioning. So um, measures of infection control led to a much decreased level of activity. People did not leave their homes. Physical activities were not where uh, scheduled physical activities uh, were canceled. Uh, so it is very likely uh, that um, uh, people in their homes suffered from inactivity and all the problems that follow from that. And there's much more, there's many more examples I could uh, give you here, but um, this need could not be picked up by the system because it, it does not have the, it does not have any provisions for that. Provider collaboration um, was much needed and is probably still much needed. Uh, again, on a lateral level, if one community service provider experienced a high number of uh, ill staff or if healthcare workers had to go into quarantine, that would lead to um, the um, suspension of services um, because uh, it, was, it is very difficult for other service providers to take over. This regulation has been changed, so it's much easier to collaborate now, but there have been no networks in place for search situations or for emergency situations. For example, same is true um, of that uh, there was no linkage in many cases between home care services, daycare, uh, daycare services. So no mutual assistance and support was possible. And again, if our goal is, for example, to keep healthy, um, we want to keep them out of hospital. And that is true for even if they suffer from a SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, but that would mean, mean that uh, home care providers, GPs, and other primary care providers needed to collaborate better. Um, Germany, as such, does not have a hospital at home program. We're not very good at uh, providing health care in the home. Um, so this is another, high, another issue that was highlighted during the pandemic because we were not in the situation that we could have kept people in their homes, avoiding hospital admissions. Information and communication, I'm sure, is an issue all in all health systems. 
And um, providers and users report that they both at the same time um, experienced a lack of information or end information overload. So both happening at the same time, very difficult for them to discern who to trust, where to get their information, what to make, how to make sense of all the information that is out there now. Um, and um, the usage of electronic, of digital information is also an issue, but wasn't raised that much. But how do I access information? How do I make sense of it? Uh, and certainly health literacy is an issue here uh, that comes into play. The rapidly changing information landscape was a challenge for providers, health insurance funds, but users um, themselves as well, uh, just keeping up with what was going on. And part of that is that there's inconsistency and conflicting information. We have heard that we have a federal level that will issue guidance, uh, general guidance, but the states are actually responsible uh, for the healthcare response, and they will alter what comes from the federal level and make up their own rules. And again, local health authorities will take those state rules and come up with their own regulations. So providers who are active in two or more municipalities will often tell you they have completely conflicting regulations just when they uh, go from one, one village to the next. Um, that's extremely confusing for users. And there's a strong wish to reduce the amount of conflicting and inconsistent information and communication. And that's also due to uh, very distributed responsibility in the health and social care system. It's not only the states and the municipalities, the health insurance fund, the long-term care insurance funds and other uh, institutions are also responsibility, uh, responsible. And where, are so, where there are so many institutions with some responsibility, it's hard to find out who is actually ultimately responsible. And the regional variation in our system is certainly an issue here. So we've heard that home care is a policy priority and uh, it should take precedence over other forms of uh, long-term care. So that's the official policy, but users and service providers feel very much that this is um, more lip service than anything. They felt that um, home care was treated almost like an afterthought in during the pandemic. And that's despite the fact that most people receive care in their homes and not in institutional settings. And there's justification for that just because of the cost of risk associated with the infection. Um, that's fair. But um, let me give you a few examples um, and how um, and uh, how how uh, how home care is still perceived. So while there is comprehensive and regular updated guidance document from the federal level regarding infection uh, protection in long-term care in residential long-term care, uh, no such document exists to date for home care, which is quite surprising. Um, and there was no official guidance on infection control in general for the uh, home care settings, even before the pandemic, and no such guidance exists even now. And um, uh, instead, home care providers and users are directed to draw conclusions from those guidance documents that were drawn up for residential care. Um, but you would agree with me, I'm sure, that uh, a, a care home is nothing like someone's home where we're just guests as nurses and other healthcare workers. So, um, and plus one point that really caused some frustration is that um, carers in private settings were not prioritized for vaccination uh, initially and had to be included in a later, uh, in a later step. So um, especially users and providers told us this system needs to be turned on its feet and, feet and truly be focused on home care if home care is a priority. So let me just in finishing offer some possible conclusions here on where from here and what the way forward could be. Um, this might not be nothing, this might not be anything new, but I think we really, really need to listen to service users and we need to listen more closely because they tell us what to do and they have quite good grasp of what's wrong in the system and what they want to change. To listen, we also need better data. It's not, um, for me, I can't comprehend that we still don't have any proper data on uh, the home care setting really that is comprehensible and that gives us a good picture and I don't know on what to pay, uh, place policy and practice with incomplete data. Um, as a nurse, I feel very strongly that we need to prioritize 
um, user and family education, as well as prevention and health promotion in the home care setting. This needs to be included in the package that uh, families and users can easily access. Um, and nurses are ideally placed to um, deliver these services. We need to integrate nursing services or home care services with primary care services and not regard them as something separate. Um, if we want a sustainable uh, and resilient health system, these connections need to be made on the local level. So responses can be flexible and can um, really adapt to uh, arising new situations. I wonder what the future of very small independent home care providers is such that only employ 10 to 12 people who did not have the, uh, the resources to really respond well when it came to information needs and other aspects of handling the pandemic. And certainly, I don't know what the solution here is, but information management and distribution has to be completely uh, overhauled, I think. So my takeaway is really make home care a real priority, and that includes dedicating administrative structures to home care, which are not there yet. And probably I should add, um, make municipalities partners in organizing home care and don't leave them uh, uh, standing uh, on the sideline. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, for such an interesting insight into this very complex situation of uh, home care. Um, if you have any questions, if you put them in the chat, we'll pick them up when we get to the um, discussion, um, or you keep them and can ask them yourself later. Um, but I'd like to hand over now to Heinz Wolfgang, who will be talking about mortality in care homes. Thank you. Good day also from me to you, and uh, thanks for having me. And uh, actually, that's what I want to discuss with you, four points uh, first. Uh, giving a broad uh, overview on how uh, COVID affected uh, the long-term care scene in, in Germany. Talk a bit about excess mortality, uh, then turning to mortality in nursing homes, and in the end, uh, trying to, to, to explain uh, whether we can say something about uh, the factors that determine the differences between nursing homes. Also, of course, with the idea uh, of uh, can we learn from that for the future. And uh, let's go into that. And uh, the first uh, slide here shows you the three waves we have seen in Germany, the first wave last Eastern, the second wave around uh, new, new Year, and the third wave uh, also around Eastern again. And what you can clearly see at the red line, that's the number of deaths. Uh, and it follows the, the black line at the number of new cases per day with uh, about three weeks uh, in between. And you see it happened in the first wave and the second wave. And you see also in the third wave, uh, we see a change because of vaccination of the elderly had taken place then already by the end of April, uh, we see the mortality is not going up that much again in the third wave, uh, which also gives, uh, of course, uh, some hope for the fourth wave for next autumn. But um, it means something uh, for, for also long-term care because uh, uh, the very old people with a care dependency who have been at the forefront of the deceased uh, from COVID in the first two waves haven't been so in the third wave. And you can also see that here from uh, a breakdown uh, according to weeks, that's the weeks of the pandemics, and then some age bands. And you see the blue age band that's uh, 80 years old and older. And uh, you can see it in absolute numbers, but also in, in, in their share, uh, how prominent they were in the first wave and the second wave. And you can see, if I put in the waves, in the third wave now, the 80 plus uh, don't play that much uh, of a role anymore. And I think that's uh, due to the vaccination. Um, Turning to excess mortality, you here see uh, that's from, from the European uh, mortality monitoring activity. Uh, that's all the European countries that are in this monitor uh, pooled. And the interesting thing is uh, uh, that you don't see much of a difference uh, between all, all ages and old age, that, that means 85 plus. So the curves are almost the same in the first and uh, also in the second 
wave here. And I, I should say something about uh, this uh, Momo in, in Germany, particularly if we uh, look into the German figures. Uh, uh, Germany participates only with two of the, the countries and, and uh, the, the, the provinces, the, the Bundesländer, that has Hessen uh, and, and, and Berlin. That means together it's about 10, 15% of the German population. So that's not really representative uh, for, for Germany. Nevertheless, nevertheless, that's the best data we have on this level. And what you can see here, if you compare the UK and Germany, uh, particularly during the first wave, you see the very high excess mortality in, in England. Uh, it goes up to a factor of 40 or something like that, while you had nothing in Germany, almost nothing, only a very small peak in, 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 in Germany. Uh, while in the second wave, uh, the, the peak is not as high as in England, but also considerable uh, in, in, in Germany. And uh, this is from, uh, the, from the report that has been mentioned before twice already from uh, the uh, VIDO, that's the, the Scientific Institute of the AOK, which is the, the biggest fund in Germany. And they did some calculations with the, the claims data from their insured. And uh, unfortunately, the only data available now is for the first wave. And we do not even have something for the second, uh, not to speak about the third. Uh, but you can see here uh, those uh, uh, lines and, and uh, the, the, they are in German. So I can tell you that the blue line is 2020 and uh, the gray line is the, the average of the years before, of four, five years before. Uh, and, and you can see, um, uh, uh, if you look at the, the whole population, it's the, the, the top uh, graphic uh, that from week, let's say 12, 13 something, uh, we had excess uh, mortality. And we had it also uh, in the nursing home population. That's the lower graph. That's the nursing home population of those uh, insured with the AOK, which is about half of all the nursing home population. And you see here this excess more mortality and you see it even better if the, the, the zero line is flattened. Uh, then you can see during the first uh, uh, wave, we had, uh, we had uh, excess uh, mortality in nursing homes. And that's from, from the claims data analysis of the uh, AOK. And if I try to, to collect what we have, and we have uh, uh, for the first wave, we have something. Uh, we, uh, our institute ourselves, we did also a survey uh, and uh, in, in April and May last year. And we calculated that about half of all deaths were uh, uh, with COVID-19 were from people uh, from nursing homes, from nursing home residents. Um, uh, Clara already uh, referred to the uh, data from the Robert Koch Institute, and these Robert Koch Institute data have one considerable disadvantage, and I can just show it uh, by referring to this graph. You see the dotted line, and that's the number of uh, uh, people who died, and we don't know whether they have lived in a nursing home before or not. That's those who are unsecure, we are unsecure about. And then you have the, the black line, that's what the Robert Koch Institute is always publishing. That's the line and that, that's, so to say, a lower margin. And in the first wave, that was about 40%. But if you calculate uh, on the basis of those where we have information from whether they are in a nursing home or not, then you get the red line and you see uh, a line that's uh, uh, even in the first wave already way, way above, well above the, the, the 50% line. So, so it confirms that during the first wave, you could say every second person died with COVID-19 was coming from a nursing home. And you can see here also, uh, if, if you look at the dotted line, uh, when the second wave started, what happened? Uh, the, the number of people where we don't know about increased dramatically. By the end of October, it was already, uh, it reached 60%. For 60%, we don't know. And uh, after that, the Robert Koch Institute uh, stopped uh, giving the figure of the number of those we don't know about. So the, so the insecurity uh, itself is insecure, uh, which means uh, you shouldn't give too much about the figures the Robert Koch Institute is uh, publishing from now. Uh, so I would conclude for the second wave, uh, um, 
I still guess that, uh, uh, that the share of those uh, uh, who, who deceased coming from nursing homes is uh, above 50%, but we can no longer be sure about that, not from the RKI data. And uh, for the third wave, uh, we really don't much, but uh, guessing from what we've seen about the age bands, I assume that it's no longer a major problem, people dying from nursing homes. But um, um, as Thomas said before, it's uh, amazing how little data we have for some basic information. Yeah. Okay, um, during the first wave, the majority of nursing homes had no case of uh, SARS-CoV-2 at all. Um, and that meant also that the exposition to the virus was the major determinant of outcomes. And um, uh, I've plotted this line here. And unfortunately, that's all from the first wave because uh, data from the second wave is not available yet. Uh, and you can see here, there's a fairly high correlation between the community cases in the population um, uh, related to 100 uh, residents in nursing homes. And on the other hand, the share of nursing homes which, with outbreaks. And uh, the reason for that is that in some parts of Germany, for example, in eastern pa part of Germany, at that time, you had hardly any outbreak at all. And then you had nothing in nursing homes, which means that this factor is uh, very important in explaining the outcomes. And uh, that's also true here if uh, we, we, cook, uh, we look at, uh, about uh, the average share of infected residents for those uh, who have outbreaks at all. Uh, but you can see even here, the, the correlation is becoming smaller because the, the, those with zero are no longer included here. We tried with this data from the, the survey from May also to, to check, can we see something which nursing homes are more affected than others? And uh, uh, what we saw is that uh, the number of beds uh, is uh, a significant uh, factor. And uh, what we have seen is that uh, larger nursing homes were much better coping than smaller ones. We explained that because they have more resources. Uh, they, 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 they have sometimes overhead stuff and they could react faster uh, than small homes. And uh, you it's reflected in the data. And the other thing that's reflected in the data is the staff ratio. Uh, we've used the nurses per 100 residents uh, ratio here. And uh, I have to admit, it's not easy to calculate that because you don't really know how many nurses and how, how many people at all are working in a nursing home. You have to do some, some acrobatics with, 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 with the figures to, to get to, to any result. And that result uh, we got here, you've got a binomial logistic regression and you see uh, in yellow, the factors that were significant at all, the number of beds, the nurses per 100 residents ratio, and of course, the spread of the virus. And you see in green um, that it's explaining 10% of the variation. That's not that much, uh, to be honest. Uh, and it's getting a bit better if we, uh, uh, here use the multi, multiple linear regression uh, model uh, and, and uh, the share of infected residents, infected residents as dependent variable, then we end up with an explanatory power of 20%. Uh, and uh, once again, I have uh, highlighted in yellow the um, significant uh, factors. But uh, uh, for the first wave, I would still hold the major effect was, of course, whether there is virus in the area or not. And um, uh, yes, uh, of course, if there had been big differences in the nursing homes and uptaking protective measures, we might have seen something. But within a few days or weeks, more or less, most uh, nursing homes try to adapt the recommendations to some extent. So, so the variation in the independent variable there is also not that big. Which leads to the conclusion uh, in the first wave, excess mortality was low in Germany. However, if we look on the, in, into the nursing home residents, we see half of all deceased came from nursing homes. Uh, for the second wave, uh, the, uh, the excess mortality is much higher. And while Germany went quite well through the first wave, that's not true for the second. Uh, we have a much higher excess mortality. Uh, and But, but uh, for, for nursing homes, data is already becoming scarce. And we can conclude from the age bands, however, uh, um, um, and, and from the data we have for 
the end of 2020 at least, that nursing homes uh, are still or have still been a major hotspot in the second wave. And that's changing completely for the third wave, which we can only conclude from, from the age bands. And uh, I, I think that's a clear effect of the vaccination, which was in Germany uh, very much concentrated on the, on the old aged and uh, on some nursing staff. Yeah. While the spread of the infection is the major determinant uh, also for nursing home outcomes, the size of the facility and the staffing ratio have some significant effect uh, uh, on the outcomes. Uh, and particular for the staffing ratio, of course, that's uh, a result which I like very much because uh, it's one of the key issues also for the next years that we have not enough staff and not enough nurses in particular. And uh, that's another hint showing that we have to increase that. Uh, the, the ongoing uh, legislation is, is uh, putting some uh, emphasis on that. But of course, I'm not that satisfied because it's going too slowly as always. But at least it's going in the right direction. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Heinz, for giving us uh, such a helpful understanding of the complexity of the data and some insights into what might be going on uh, behind those very crude numbers that we get from the Robert Koch Institute. Um, there are already a few uh, questions in the chat. If you have any other thoughts, please do add them in and we'll pick them up in a moment. But I'd like to now hand over to Francisca Laporte Arib, who will take us and uh, sort of take a, a bit of a look out beyond Germany, but also what we can learn from other countries. Thank you, Clara, and uh, thank you so much for having me. My name is Francisca Laporte Riebe. I am uh, working at the Deutsche Zentrum für Neurodegenerative Erkrankung here in Witten. And as Clara already kindly pointed out, I am providing some sort of a uh, yeah, look uh, beyond the current um, challenges, not of course uh, ignoring them at all, um, but trying to learn from them. And uh, it's also in terms of the topic, as well as the content I can provide to you today, um, somewhat of a contrast. So just bear with me, but I hope it's interesting. Um, just see, so you can see this properly. So just very briefly uh, on uh, my where I'm coming from, uh, the Deutsche Zentrum für Neurodegenerative Erkrankung actually um, uh, is covering uh, 10 research sites. Uh, it's part of the Helmut Society in Germany, the largest uh, government funded uh, um, science organization. And uh, we cover a wide range of areas starting from fundamental research uh, through to clinic and population sciences and systems medicine. But what uh, Witten does, uh, and also together with our colleagues from Rostock and Greifswald, is to focus on healthcare research. Now, what I'm presenting today is a collaborative effort um, between three countries. Uh, and you can uh, see here, um, this, so you can see this properly. Um, you can see that uh, it's, um, yes, we have Germany um, and uh, we collaborate here with the University of Bonn. Um, but the two other countries are somewhat exotic and uh, you might already get a hint uh, for if you have been to either of those countries, what the common uh, context might be here. Uh, one of the things they have in common is that they are not just far away from Germany, but they also have, um, well, one is an island, but uh, in comparison to that, uh, Chile or Chile um, is also so somewhat isolated because it's actually, um, um, at the Andes uh, go all the way uh, down uh, the country and uh, therefore it's somewhat also comparable uh, to an island location, I guess. Uh, the biggest uh, common denominator though between those two countries and why they have been included is that they are two countries that are prone um, to continuous natural disasters, such as volcano eruptions or earthquakes. So what is our core idea? Well, we started with a couple of questions. Are we starting? I have to say with a couple of questions. Um, so one of the questions is how can we actually ensure that innovations that undoubtedly are happening right now and uh, the website that is organized by uh, Adelina and uh, Sarah is a great example for that, um, but also the work from Alzheimer's Disease International as well as Alzheimer's Europe shows that how can we make sure that those innovations are not just merely considered as a reaction to a crisis, but actually outlive those crises and become part of routine care and structures. 
how can we actually make sure that uh, those experiences made um, in the current pandemic, for example, ultimately actually contribute to strengthening healthcare systems preparedness and resilience, and also in turn contribute towards increased resilience in people living with dementia and their families. What are actually the lessons that we can take from this current pandemic and how can they be applied to addressing the global crisis of dementia? So as I already was pointing towards, um, we think by there's translation of there's translation potential that lies in global cross-country learning. So what we are intending to do is to take three high-income countries, Chile, New Zealand, and Germany. And yes, they have distinct geopolitical cultural systems. But as I already pointed out, um, two of those countries are high, considered geographically high-risk countries, and one Germany so far can be considered geographically low-risk country. So what we want to do is to look into the facilitators and barriers of innovation during the COVID-19 pandemic. So simply put, what works for whom and why? And what can we learn from this for now, but more importantly, almost beyond the current COVID-19 pandemic? And uh, Thomas already pointed towards some of those uh, key words that of course pop up all across the system at the moment is how can we with these questions contribute towards adequate, equitable and sustainable care and support for those living with dementia during the pandemic and beyond. So you might receive from the research question uh, or, or from the idea that my um, field is very much the home care setting and this is the main focus or will be the main focus of this research. However, um, of course we can't ignore um, the uh, what we just heard in terms of numbers and uh, residential care. Now, just to give you a very, very small glimpse at uh, why this might actually be of importance. You can see here a graph um, from the Lowy Institute based in Australia, and some of you might have come across it previously, and it only covers um, numbers going um, into mid-March this year. But what they did is they consider a number of factors such as geography, political systems, population sites, and economic development, and then determine the impact of COVID-19 outcomes around the world. And so if you see actually um, those three lines, it might be a little bit difficult to, to see, but uh, the green one here um, is Chile. This blue line um, is Germany, and the one here on top is New Zealand. So those lines um, just, I mean, I don't want to overemphasize this, but they actually hint towards that there might be something worthwhile investigating if there is such a thing, such as enabling um, cross-country learning between those three countries. So what are our research questions? Well, we are asking how have those three selected nations responded to the needs of people living with dementia and of their families prior to the pandemic and during the COVID-19 pandemic? How does living in countries that are prone continuously to natural risks and hazards might actually impact on building resilience and enabling responses to rapid, yes, in this case, respiratory pandemics such as the COVID-19 pandemic on the one hand and to long-term challenges such as dementia on the other hand? And how might this differ to countries with fewer natural risks and hazards such as Germany? What can we learn from those global experience to empower healthcare systems to provide adequate, equitable and sustainable care and support for families living with dementia during the pandemic and beyond? Okay, just also to give you a very small glimpse of what, why this might be important research for New Zealand, for example because I couldn't expect all of you to be familiar with the situation over there. So it's just a very, very, very small glimpse. But for New Zealand, which is a small island nation, there are currently total cost of dementia in the region of 1 billion euros. And this is expected to almost triple by 2050. Um, currently, the situation is still that uh, the, the services are considered inadequate, um, that there's a large quality variability, uh, depending on where you're living, and uh, that the current services are not necessarily capable, at least not to everybody and in all regions of New Zealand, to meeting the growing demand. This becomes quite, um, quite obvious, for example, when you look into the existing health disparities of Maori versus non-Maori New Zealand population, where Maori are more likely to have dementia, present to uh, neurologists at a younger age, and for example, have a threefold increased risk to die 
using antipsychotics, which was just um, investigated in the car a few years ago. Um, also on a policy level, the National Dementia Plan um, for 2020 to 2025 has not officially been adopted. So it has been part of the pre-election campaigns, but there has no, um, there have been no implementation efforts or actual funding efforts towards implementing this plan. So far for New Zealand, how about Chile? Well, Latin American countries show some of the fastest growing dementia rates worldwide, but actually they are largely underrepresented in the research. Now this might very much change from my point of view, um, South America, if you want to put this whole continent together. And again, it's just, you know, we, I'm just gonna provide you a small glimpse here. Um, South America seems to be very much on its way from my personal point of view to really address um, the, the increasing numbers of, and of incidents uh, and mortality rates of people living with dementia. And they provide some great efforts towards infrastructure, research infrastructure. Um, and so there's a lot happening on this continent right now. Well, for Chile in particular, they actually have um, a national dementia plan that was adopted by the Ministry of Health in 2017. And it proposes establishing a range of healthcare services from primary care to memory, memory units. But as you can see from this goal alone, it's a country that is just starting off. Um, and I hope my colleagues in Chile agree with me on this one. It's just starting off um, establishing some structural support services for people with dementia. And I'm not talking specifically about a certain setting here. Um, interestingly, I thought that uh, yes, in Chile as well, like many countries around the world, the COVID-19 pandemic is considered as an opportunity to rethink traditional public policy response towards the needs of older people uh, living in Chile. Now, when you take the global picture, why is this important? Why is this research, why is our research, and I don't just talk about me, but also about uh, what uh, Heinz and Thomas have been presenting, why is this important? Well. If you consider the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities from the United Nations 2006, it actually states that all necessary measures have to be taken to ensure the protection and safety of persons with disability in risk situations, including the occurrence of disaster. By promoting international collaborations in partnership with regional organizations and civil societies to support national efforts in ensuring the objectives of the Convention, Article 32. Okay, so, and this is just a very, very early idea. What might be in this uh, for Germany, participating in this somewhat exotic uh, combination of countries? Well, in Germany, um, you might be aware, uh, just a few days ago, actually, the, Europe, the EU Atlas uh, was published by my colleagues from uh, the in, uh, in Greifswald, also Greifswald, on dementia and migration. So in Germany, there is a growing need for innovations to overcome inequity, inequity of access to support, for example, amongst families living with dementia who have a migration background. And this was um, made very clear um, when you consider the EU Atlas. Uh, we might also um, learn in terms of care models that are embracing family members much stronger as care partners. Um, and as I say, what I'm talking about here is somewhat of a harsh contrast, but I'm also glad that we heard already with such uh, honesty and transparency about the challenges about specific numbers, because um, what we try to do with this approach is to really understand the phenomena, the attitudes towards disaster. And so by doing so, we might actually critically consider the costs that we had um, with increasing institutionalization and economization of our care system here in Germany. And we might actually look towards care that is deeply rooted in relationship building. Uh, and yes, it's our hope that we might actually achieve um, knowledge with regard to system preparedness beyond uh, the pure, somewhat technical uh, disaster response that is often focused on in disaster research. Well, what are the challenges that can we expect? As you can possibly imagine, there will be quite a few. One of the starting points, well, how comparable are these countries really? There is obviously a high level of complexity that needs to be considered. Um, and then how do we want to approach su such a complex analysis? And what can we actually learn? And just listening uh, to a presentation the other day, 
is it actually possible to learn something from each other? When you look at the Essex Rat in uh, Germany, are uh, very critically reflecting on the fact that uh, from previous epidemics uh, like SARS, we already have published their, their, uh, this material available that pointed very clearly towards this potential pandemic happening. And really, is it possible to really learn something? But again, then our frame and our focus is somewhat of a narrow one, uh, talking about persons living with dementia. Now, again, just as a small teaser, that's why I call it towards methodology, some uh, keywords that might give you a hint towards what we are intending to do in terms of uh, methodologic approaches. Yes, uh, it has to be multidisciplinary, but also strengths-based. Um, we want to consider the resilience of healthcare systems as learning systems. We want to follow in current developments or more recent, not current, but more recent developments of applying participatory research elements, which is nicely going hand in hand with disaster research, um, calling strongly for making the research all about the person that is affected, including these people as um, experts by experience. Um, it, there is, from our point of view, strong translational potential, uh, not only potential between translating from natural disaster to biological disaster, but also potential from translating from this somewhat short term, shorter term or acute pandemic disaster to the global um, pandemic of dementia, if you like. Um, there's also, from our point of view, the potential to apply the knowledge that we gain through this um, on dementia to the broader health system. Because I'm sure whatever we find here is something that has applicability beyond dementia. We will consider the timeline to some, I'm not sure how we're going to do all this. I, I have some ideas, but I can't go into much detail. But there will be a, a, a lens on acute, post-acute and long-term crisis. And we also gonna not just look at uh, one level, but we have to talk about the individual organization and national level. So overall, it's very complex and we have just uh, are in the process of publishing a paper. So if you like more details or maybe later in the discussion, uh, just approach me. No, well, just to sum up, what do we already have? Well, I'm really, really grateful for having a very motivated, multidisciplinary cross-sectoral consortium from those three countries. And as you can see, covering quite a wide range of disciplines. Um, and that is somewhat probably unusual. You might see it here um, between the somewhat more traditional dementia-related disciplines. There's also um, our esteemed colleague from the University of Bonn uh, with a background in geography and geology and disaster management. We have a vision that actually uh, we can agree on and a commitment. And yes, while the COVID pandemic has exposed vulnerabilities our system and people, we want to challenge this not by just by taking a strengths-based approach and a uh, participatory approach, but we want to really focus on this as a unique opportunity to learn from both failures and innovations. Okay, and that is it for me. I would like to also thank you, my co-authors, and um, I'm very happy to discuss things in more detail if you're interested. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francisca. It was really great to see, and I think it's one of the, the things that we've been seeing throughout the LTC COVID initiative, that actually, even though COVID has a lot of really negative and, and awful impacts on, on people, but actually bringing people together, learning from systems, I think is probably one of the, the very positive outcomes. And that sounds like a very interesting study. Um, before we discuss these things, and I know things have been going on in the chat, I want to very briefly take you through one more slide um, and also just uh, let you know about other upcoming events, and then we'll move on to um, the next uh, sort of discussion. And I apologize, I've been told that my uh, microphone is apparently not working very well and I've been trying to set things up so that it's uh, working better, but I, I don't know. If you don't hear me, if someone just interrupts, um, then that'd be great, but I'm sorry about that. So um, yes, this is this one slide that I wanted to show to you. And this is really just a bit of an overview of um, things that we've heard and perhaps things that we haven't heard and to kind of just give a brief summary of, of things that we've learned about what's been happening to the German long-term care sector throughout COVID and the main policy responses. So 
So if we start from the left hand side, there are, of course, as in, in many other systems, some existing issues that were there pre COVID. And um, it was mentioned earlier about the workforce shortage. Um, so that clearly was an issue already before COVID-19 uh, hit. Um, and there also um, was issues with technical infrastructure of local health authorities that then became a problem as they needed to step in to actually transfer a lot of information. But there also was um, a bit of preparedness actually. So Germany had a national pandemic plan for influenza that was regularly updated, that thought of uh, some of the uh, hygiene and, and um, uh, infection prevention uh, protocols that could then be adapted. So it didn't start completely from scratch. As I mentioned earlier, the federal government has a dedicated person responsible for care. So that person could actually be involved early on in conversations about uh, responses to COVID. There's a relatively high rate comparatively of intensive care beds in Germany, which also enabled a slightly different response than other countries. Uh, and high laboratory capacity, which helped in response with testing. I mean, of course, it doesn't mean that there weren't issues in Germany. Um, this is more in a, in a comparative, um, in terms of what we also learned from other things. Um, but uh, of course, uh, COVID-19 highlighted a number of issues and especially people um, with background from the UK uh, will probably, um, and, and probably many other countries uh, recognize a number of these things that I highlight here. So the workforce, uh, was further reduced and uh, Thomas mentioned this earlier through infection and isolation and that became problematic in, in all uh, kind of uh, levels of care. The PPE sh shortage that was uh, experienced early in the pandemic and the, the costs that were associated with that, then access to vaccination, organization of vaccination, um, the lack of the uniform response, which was mentioned uh, several times before, that the different Bundesländer, the responses differed, and that caused several challenges. And then specifically to residential care, um, that there was an observation that there was a difference in level of preparedness regarding the hygiene plans, uh, plans that LTC uh, providers had in place, um, issues around training on infection control around in the workforce, um, then the workloads that actually implementing and preparing the infection prevention uh, protocols and testing and administrating all of these things. Um, access to external service providers, uh, which includes medical doctors, and of course the big topic of visitors in care homes, um, which then led to is issues of uh, social isolation and um, observing the deterioration of physical health. Stop of admission, um, and uh, later on then the implementation of visiting protocols and trying to find safe ways of ena enabling people to see their relatives um, was another challenge. In terms of responses, um, the whole sector, even though of course Thomas mentioned earlier that there had to be some improvements made uh, in the um, domiciliary care sector, was, uh, there was a prioritization uh, for vaccination of people with older people, people uh, particularly vulnerable, and um, people working in health and long-term care sector. Um, the, there was a response to the workforce situation in that there was, well, it's been announced an increase in, in pay for care stuff uh, in that latest care reform, even though there's a lot of discussion around it, what that actually means and whether actually it provides the, the, that level of improvement that we would require to actually make a, a, a proper change in the system. There were also bonus payments, uh, one bonus payment uh, in 2020. Um, that was also, um, for some, by some people welcomed, by others was criti uh, criticized a lot, but it was one of the responses by which uh, policymakers tried to, to kind of respond to some of the challenges that the, the sector has been experiencing. In terms of uh, responses towards care providers, um, there was temporary support for care homes from armed forces and civil protection organizations helping with outbreaks. Um, guidance on infection prevention measures. Oh, again, the domiciliary sector has been uh, a bit left out in this. Um, there was support with the PPE supply, um, followed by that shortage. Um, funding packages uh, that support payments uh, for care providers to fill gaps that they've experienced. There was allowance to deviate from some rules around staffing and subcontracting, and Thomas mentioned some of that earlier. Um, suspension of quality controls and access to testing for staff and um, 
people with uh, people living in, in residential care homes particularly. And in terms of unpaid carers, and this is a group we haven't really touched on today, um, there was uh, additional but also flexible use of funding and some funding for protective equipment made available. There was an extension of rights to stay away from work and an interest-free loan due to loss of income for those in need. So this is really just to kind of give you a bit of an overview, picking up on, on some of the things that were presented, um, but also a, a very broad outline. Um, but I would like, um, oops, sorry, no, I'm just a minute um, going back. I would now like to point you, before we move on to the discussion, um, to the next webinars, because there's two uh, very interesting webinars coming up, one on COVID-19 vaccinations and immunity in care homes, um, which looks at data from the UK and Canada, and one on uh, COVID-19 and long-term uh, care systems, providing insights from perspectives from France, Italy, and Portugal, and an overview of OECD responses. So uh, this is just to alert you to uh, future webinars, but now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then I won't come back to the presentation. Um, and uh, it would be great if any of you have any questions, if you want to unmute and ask your question, raise your hand, or I've seen there's a number of things in, this, in the chat, which I'll have a look at, but if there are any, any burning questions to any of the speakers, um, then please feel to uh, unmute and uh, ask your question. Right, perhaps um, we start picking up with uh, some of the questions from the chat. Um, there was a question from Adelina about excess theft uh, on the analysis um, uh, that Heinz presented. Adelina, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, so we, we had the puzzle in looking at England and Wales data on excess deaths that in the second wave, which in the UK was kind of quite long, we ended up with a negative excess deaths for quite a bit, a big part of the period. And then when you look a bit further, it turns out that the, the data we were looking at had not been adjusted by a very important decrease uh, of almost 10% in the numbers of people living in care homes. So basically the denominator was shrinking, but not only that, the age and gender composition, we were able to then find out a bit more about it. And the people who were remaining in the care homes were younger and also more female, which is helpful in terms of risk of COVID mortality. And I just didn't, I don't know if this data that you showed, Heinz, or that Clara also mentioned uh, in Germany has been adjusted by changes during the pandemic in the denominator, because that makes a big difference to how you calculate excess deaths. I, I think I presented uh, data from three sources. Uh, the one is the Robert Koch Institute. And I've already mentioned that the biggest problem there is that you don't even know whether people live in nursing homes or not. And, and that data is actually you cannot use it it's 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 useless and uh, in the chat uh, um, someone uh, i was just reading it uh, said uh, that on, on some of the municipality levels uh, the information is there and uh, uh, i'm not sure uh, how that uh, is, is spread out in, in 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 the whole republic but i think that's something uh, we should work on that this information is people die uh, whether they have lived in nursing homes before that, it, it, it's not rocket science to, to identify this information. And uh, I think that's something the Robert Koch Institute should be working on. The second thing is the, the, the uh, European MOMO uh, source. And uh, once again, the, the biggest problem here is that only 10% of the German population is included at all. Uh, it's only Hessen and, and Berlin, so, Berlin. So, so it, it's tricky as well. Uh, if we turn to the, the, the claims data from the uh, our car from, from the video, I think they did it properly. Uh, uh, I, I must admit, uh, it came out last week, uh, and we all had a look into that. And I have had no chance uh, to, to talk to, to Antje Schwinger uh, about this later on because he's on vacation now. Uh, but we will certainly do that and, and, and check all these things because we, of course we have indirect effects of, of COVID. People were avoiding going to nursing homes. 
yeah, which means that uh, the, the absolute number should have uh, uh, gone down. But um, uh, the, the figure I'm, uh, if we talk about excess mortality, of course, you're right. If we talk about what is the share of people dying from a nursing home, it's different. So we have to dig in much more into that. And, and I think the claims data, uh, they allow for, for such analysis. And uh, so I, I trust them much more than um, uh, the official data. Thank you, Heinz. Thank you. Um, there was also a question from uh, Stephanie um, about uh, care, large care homes and having an advantage in, in the infection control um, and whether this could be down to architecture or the ability to isolate people with infection. Um, I mean, I, I read your study, Heinz, and I was actually thinking I had a similar question, but um, I was wondering if you have any more uh, information on that. No, unfortunately, we, we haven't. I mean, I mean uh, Stephanie uh, pointed to that. Thomas also added some comment. And I think it's true. And we know that from conversations with uh, owners of, of nursing homes uh, that, of course, if they are larger, they can easier, uh, on one hand, uh, for example, uh, channel the flow of people coming in and out so that they don't need, that they can have separate rooms. And, and it makes it easier. And of course, we have different generations of nursing homes. Huh? We have homes that were built 50 years ago, and we have ones that were built uh, just last year. And that uh, makes uh, a lot of uh, uh, room for maneuver, you know, uh, depending on, on what, what you are. Uh, we don't have this information in our data. Uh, so I don't think we, we can really check that. We can, of course, uh, check the interaction effect uh, between uh, size on one hand and, and, and uh, stuffing level. Uh, and uh, up to now, we haven't done any interaction effect at all because uh, uh, we are at the moment still processing a second wave of the survey and want to analyze, analyze that together. And so, so we're not that far, but uh, there are interaction effects and I'm quite sure about it. But some of the information about uh, what is this, the, the specialty of this home, how nursing home, how is it built? And so uh, we don't have it. I, I think that's something you, you could do uh, in, in interviews, face-to-face -face interviews with some people and asking them and uh, uh, to go to, around that more in a qualitative way. If I may, if I, may, I think it's, I totally agree with what you said, but adding to that, um, we're just not looking close enough and we should have looked better and have developed better systems of uh, classifying what's actually going on in long-term care. And architecture is one aspect. Uh, the other is concept really, and that links to, uh, that is linked together. And you have no way of discerning that if you haven't pre-classified uh, that and this work is has not been done, even though uh, from different subdisciplines of nursing and social sciences, we, we know that we could do it, but it has not been done. And the numbers and the regular figures, so our official statistics around um, long term care uh, in Germany are pretty old, they have never been overhauled. Uh, they're basically down to how much money do we spend where and how many people do work there. So this is pretty sorry. Uh, excuse my, if I'm being quite frank here, but this is pretty useless when it comes to um, improving services. Seriously, this is tax. I mean, it's good that we we're talking about how much um, um, bang we get for the buck, but um, this is not all we need to know. We really need to know what we are getting and what is the influence here. So, um, if we could all together use this to really make good suggestions on how this standardized data collection could be improved and needs to be improved. I think this would be very helpful. Yeah, and maybe we can uh, address that directly to Christian Beringer, who is in the audience. Uh, maybe he can take up some of the suggestions or maybe he can also tell us something about, is there anything planned in the ministry about that? If he's still there, I've seen- No, I'm still. Hi. Sorry for four. Well, uh, well, it's no problem. <laughs> I I, um, <laughs> if I may, uh, after you have introduced me, my name is Christian Beringer. I'm from the Ministry of Health in Germany and I'm also responsible for uh, some part of the policies towards uh, long term care and COVID 19. And I've been listening very closely because it was very interesting. 
uh, the points uh, that have been made by the speakers. Yes, of course, uh, we are now at the point uh, to sum up lessons learned from what we have done, uh, from what we have not done, why we were not prepared enough, and what needs to be done in the future. And um, it has to do with data, it has to do with preparedness on the political level, but also on the level of the uh, uh, care institutions. Uh, of course, and um, some points have been made what, uh, uh, about the data, the statistics. We know now very a bit better uh, what has happened, uh, but what I think is very much uh, very important to know in the future and what we must find out in the future in the next few months is what has worked and what has not worked. Of the many instruments we have been trying to introduce um, Clara has shown in the last uh, 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 picture the number of policies we have tried to introduce and to, to bring to into use, and some have worked and some have not worked, but we don't know exactly what's, what's the good thing and what's what has not worked. And uh, of course, uh, there are some general um, developments we must uh, look at, that is uh, the staffing the attractiveness of the um, uh, of, uh, working in the care sector, which is very important. This has been a major point of the recent reform we have introduced only last month into care policies and which will hopefully begin to work as Rotgang knows exactly what's going to happen. Uh, um, and um, then we all also have to look at, um, or let me say so, uh, last week, then the Blake report was presented, the report we have been talking about uh, um, by the AOK, by the uh, uh, Insurance Fund of the AOK, by the Weedow Institute. Um, it was shown as uh, different care homes reacted differently. Some were in the middle of their local community and others were not integrated into other systems of care and support. And I think this is a very important point to bring up a sort of uh, local coordination and integration of uh, health, uh, long-term care and other social support systems. The problem from the central government point of view is that they only can uh, very scarcely um, control or um, contribute to us what is happening on the local level. So coming from the organization of the long-term care insurance system, which of course has been the main source of our data up to, we have been looking uh, on the Robert Koch Institute data, uh, we are step-by-step step, uh, thinking about how to better coordinate between the different level of responsibilities, the central state responsibility, the lender responsibility, which played a major role, um, uh, for example, for the visiting rules and the testing rules and the closures of uh, care institutions um, in 2020, especially in the first wave, and also on the local level, how to coordinate services and uh, to um, support care institutions better to cope with uh, emergency situations. Uh, I think these are some points uh, which are important from our uh, view, and um, I'm looking forward to work together with those uh, colleagues from uh, German institutions which have been speaking here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian Beringer, for those insights. That's been very interesting. Um, I'd like to pick up a couple of questions that are in the chat as well. And there's one from Stefania Elinka. Stefania, would you like to speak? Well, Heinz already addressed my question. Oh. It was really about uh, getting <laughs> to the bottom of um, how staff ratios and especially how low to skilled staff ratios might contribute to some of the differences um, that, um, that you see that are linked to facility size. Um, so I, I understand this is a planned 
further step, uh, the data seems um, really, really great. So it would be a pity not to interrogate it further. And I'd be very curious for one to, to hear a bit about that when the results come out. Great, thank you, Stefania. And then there's a question from Adelina as well. Um, Adelina, do you want to ask the question yourself? <laughs> yeah, so um, from the point of view of somebody in the UK, I would think, oh, well, in Germany, you have all these uh, insurance system data. And I know, for example, Spain has similar data as you do in terms of the people who've been assessed and who are receiving uh, benefits. And uh, the question would be, why is it that, that all this data held, held by the Cygnus funds has not been able to be mobilized to monitor and inform what was happening during the pandemic, both for people living at home and in care homes? And I presume there are institutional barriers, perhaps uh, information sharing barriers. It would be interesting to, to hear about that. I don't know if any of you would like to answer. Sorry, it's not specific to any of you. I could um, say something about that if nobody else wants to. Um, yes, we work with this claims data, and uh, um, as uh, the, the, the people from the AOK are doing their FLEGA report, I think five or six years now, we are doing uh, the one for the Obama for more than 10 years. And so we have some experience with that. And one of the problem is, uh, is uh, that we get this data only very lately. So you have to wait at least nine months um, or 12 months until you get the data. And this also has to do with data protection because we only get uh, sodomized uh, um, data and there will even be, in, in, for our sickness fund, uh, it will be strengthened. We will, be, we will get completely anonymized data, which then mean that it's no longer possible to uh, have a survey and link the data with the claims data. So it's getting worse, uh, actually. But uh, I think it's, it's a rich uh, source, uh, this data. Uh, it has, uh, of course, its weaknesses. For example, you have not very much information about the social economic status of, of uh, insured. Actually, for the for the elderly, you have almost nothing because the school education is for 85 plus. Uh, it's almost a Volksschule, so it's not differing. Differing, uh, and and you don't have information about uh, income uh, for for the pensioners because the the pension fund. Uh, put the contribution in, in one amount to the sickness fund. So uh, you, the data is weak on social economic status. It, it's rich on uh, um, diagnosis, on uh, benefits you, you received, on, on treatment you have. And uh, it's complicated uh, to, to use it for, sci for sci scientists. And uh, it's one year late. And that's, the, that's why uh, you see that the uh, Vito people have published the report last week and the data ends in spring 2020. That's the, the one year that you are behind it. And in a pandemic where you have to react from week to week or from day to day, it's not helpful at all. Thank you very much. Would any of the other speakers like to add anything? I don't think I have anything to add except for the question. Um, I, is, I mean, this really asks, this really, I mean, we, how, how do we change that system? I mean, we don't, for policy reasons and for planning and response, we don't need perfect data. I, I totally get that for research, it will take a while to make this data available and sort through it. But um, is there any, is there any way you see that we can actually use it for more short-term purposes? Because that would be very helpful. I mean, we, it doesn't have to leave the health insurance funds really, does it, for that reason? It can be aggregated. Yeah, I mean, I'm just coming just back in. Spain did uh, publish data on the population who are claiming benefits from the long-term care system, maybe about a month, uh, three months late, but, but they were able to at least during the pandemic be able to, to trace excess mortality among, for example, people who received care at home. And that was the only source there was. And I think that they've been able to now publish just a month late, so with a month uh, delay, which uh, I thought was interesting to, as an interesting response, but interesting also that other countries 
uh, were unable to, to do that, or, or perhaps that was unmade public and this was being looked at, I don't know. <laughs> but it, it would seem, uh, uh, in terms of monitoring the effects of the pandemic, it would seem a much better source of data than the Robert Koch Institute indicators, if that was available to those who are monitoring the impacts of the pandemic. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're, we're almost uh, at, at half past three. Um, I want to thank again uh, all of the speakers um, for those brilliant presentations and for those really useful insights. And I think we've all learned a lot and uh, got a lot of food for thought and uh, things to take further. And it's been an interesting discussion. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, I think we'll um, hopefully can repeat this uh, in a few months time and see where Germany has moved forward to. Um, uh, so just seeing that things are moving on the chat. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, let's let's see and uh, stay in touch and uh, and keep the con conversation going. So thank you very much, uh, everyone for joining us. And also thank you very much to the audience and for those interesting questions and comments.